In this series, we're going to give you a complete set of tools that we've developed in our research program over the last 20 years. For those of you that are new, we conducted 20,000 experiments. We invested $130 million plus dollars into a research program to answer a single question. Why do people say yes? Kieran asked such a good question. I want to share something that I'll be teaching in future episodes, but this is a coaching session. So all of you should think about your conversion and your data by something uh, using a tool we call the discovery triad. When, you're, when you as a leader or your boss comes in and asks a how question, for instance, how can I get more sales? How can we increase revenue? How can we get more subscribers? How can we generate more leads? That's what bosses ask. They ask how questions. And what they're really implying is go fix this. Never, never, never let your mind stop at how, but instead think of this as a triangle. So uh, at the top of the triangle is how, and then I'm going to move over here to the other side of the triangle. And that question is, so let's say, how can I get more leads? Here's the what question. What does the data tell me about customer behavior? That is the primary question that you apply to your metrics program. When you apply that to your metrics program, it's going to put a lens on so that you can suddenly see into your data something more important, which is the customer patterns. When you ask, what is that? For instance, let's suppose you notice that people are getting on this page, but they're not completing the form. Now I'm oversimplifying. So let's suppose you see, wow, I've got great click through from the ads. It looks like they're engaging with the page, but when I get to the form, many of them start, but don't complete it. Let's suppose your data showed you that. So you went from how to what? What does the data tell us about behavior? But that leads you to a why question now, and that completes the triad. The why question is, why are people behaving that way? And that typically leads you into the psychology of the offer. And for these almost 30 years, I've been asking, why do people say yes? But to get to the answer, I had to ask a more profound question, and that is, why do people say no? Because you get a lot of no's before you get a yes. And if I can understand the no's, I can, I can move people up the micro yes chain to the ultimate yes that turns them into a customer. So always think in terms of, and right now is your website, your challenges, all your how questions. Listen, as Peter Drucker, my favorite business philosopher said, the purpose of a business is to create a customer. And it's the job of every single person in the company and it's the number one job of the CEO. And the number one way you accomplish that is by crafting a strong value proposition. But the only way you can craft a strong value proposition is to take the how, how can I create a customer, and complement it with the, with the what question and then with the why question. This is a big company. This is Aetna's Health Spire. If you look on your left, something happened that changed the controls performance. Do you see the treatment? It represents something we call a signal set. You would call it a web page, but we view it as a signal set. It's not a page. It's not a web. It's zeros and ones turning on cues in the mind. And look at the result, 638%. Here's another. We're going to move on to another. 166%. This is another organization. That's a Toll Brothers, huge uh, nationwide builder, that's a 166% conversion rate, and that results in a 166% increase in leads. Here's another, 96%. That's Fluke, by the way, defense contractor, big organization. This is another 1,600% increase. Oh, by the way, that's the New York Times. And these are all part of the research program at Mech Labs. PR Newswire, 202%. Um, here's another piece, CBS Sports, 44.5%. Whether your business is big or small, it is possible to see exponential impacts if we can understand customer behavior. And we can understand customer behavior if we can get into their behavioral traces. I like to think of them as brain tracks. Beneath those results was a deep dive into the data to understand how people were thinking and thus how they were behaving. And so with that in mind, I'm going to talk with you about a tool that we applied in those situations to get an increase. And that tool was the subject 
of episode two in our new series, The Market Risk Philosopher. Well, in the spreadsheet tool that we downloaded, you'll see that we found in one line a break in patterns. All you need to establish a pattern is a majority. When I say majority, I mean critical mass occurs in the pattern. This is pure philosophy. When you've reached enough nodes that you can see uh, anything weighted one direction or another, it's hard with two, it's easier with three. Sometimes three numbers can give me a pattern. But the more numbers, the more reliable our understanding of that pattern can be. So look for, uh, you know, the broadest threshold you can bring in to your pattern recognition piece. Like look over a year instead of over a week. A month is better than a week, you know, and this accounts for seasonality also. So that's a technical answer to a technical question, but I'm going to keep uh, trying. So Matt, just go into your experience and tell us what you think about that. So uh, we've done uh, data analysis as short as just a, a few weeks even. Um, we've done data analysis as much as three years. Uh, it's somewhat contingent on the organization. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if you have, if you do experience any type of uh, monthly uh, seasonality, it would be helpful to have more than one year's worth of data. 12 months of data is a really good starting place. Uh, you also have to account for, and this is a, a really important consideration for any kind of timeline uh, amount of data, you have to consider for any significant changes that may have happened either in your organization, with your ideal prospect, or within your website. So let's just say I take 12 months of data, but six months ago, I redesigned my website. I'm only going to have really six months worth of relevant data to, to inform how customers are behaving or interacting with my current website. So there's no, uh, there's no golden rule in terms of the amount of data. It's really contingent on, uh, you know, how you, you know, the uniqueness of your business, as well as the things that you may have done, which may have caused changes in your data. What you're really trying to capture in your data analysis is a representative sample of customer behavior over time so that you can start to predict on if I, you know, based on what I'm seeing in the data, this is how my customer is behaving with my website right now. And you want to be able to analyze that over, let's just say periods of seasonality, whether that be weekly seasonality, monthly seasonality, et cetera. Does that make sense? And I think it's a great answer. Uh, you know, philosophically, the foundation of data analysis comes from one sort of thinking uh, skill, that is comparison. And so you're, if you're comparing future performance with previous performance, any of those different uh, items you're comparing, these elements, they determine really how long that data needs to be. And that's the philosophical answer. Matt gave you the very practical answer, and I hope that helps you with that question. Well, we're going to charge double, and double times nothing is nothing, Michael, but still, <laughs> that's probably what the advice is worth. <laughs> no, really, I, you clarified the fact because I had seen some other people had asked questions about, you know, if you have a minimal amount of traffic, what constitutes a pattern as opposed to just, yes. uh, you know, nuance. So yes. Good. That's a great, and it's a great question, Michael. And if you see episode two, you'll actually see us. We, we will highlight the numbers and we'll show you the pattern, and then we show you where we found the missing money. So hopefully that'll help. Donnie, go ahead, take over. Um, so we actually do have a version of the tool that's a bit more simplified that you can download from uh, Google Analytics Solution Gallery. It's under uh, Marketing Experiments. Um, so for some of the more simpler data pools, you can uh, just download that tool. You don't have to actually plug it in manually. Some of, uh, there's some instances where there's some more difficulty if you're making custom funnels and things like that, uh, where you would actually want to go into GA and make custom segments for those. So for the funnel itself, um, that won't be automatic, but most of the pages can be. So, so Donnie thus is telling you she's created a, a template sort, sort of tool inside of GA that you can use to pull your data automatically.
Do I have a concern about the quality of data? Well, I run two metrics programs. So somebody asked that question. Matt, what do you think people should do to sort of make certain the quality of their data is right? Now, we can certify it for you if you need extra help and you want our scientists to, if you want to use the tool and say, did I get it right? You can, you can talk to us about that. But other than that, I'm going to ask Donnie or Matt to answer that. Which one wants to go first to answer that question? Uh, sure, I can answer it. Um, okay, Matt, go ahead. So the first thing that I would do if I was looking at a data platform for quality is, and this is incredibly basic, but does it pass the sniff test? Is there something in there that is uh, that just is just uh, either completely uh, implausible or highly unlikely? Uh, and then, and, and that would uh, kind of hint to a potential quality issue. Uh, I do believe that, uh, as Flint mentioned, having a second tool is often very helpful to do so. Uh, you can also potentially. Uh, uh, if you do have a testing tool, you can also run um, what we call dual control tests that may be able to, to validate or invalidate that your metrics are tracking correctly. Can, so, Matt, can I jump in there? Absolutely. Because well, I want to point out what Matt said is very important. Everybody should do this. If you have a testing tool, run a A versus B test, but keep the pages the same. And watch and see if you see a big disparity in conversion. So when he says a dual control, just to be clear to everyone here, that means testing the same page against itself. So you have an A and you have a B, and, and at the end of the test, you're looking at that saying, well, that number should be very close, or there's something wrong with your metric setup. Matt, you want to add to that anything, or Donnie, add to that anything? Nope. Yeah, no, and I completely agree. Um, always having a second platform is, is enormously helpful. Um, just so you can see it. I mean, usually there is going to be a little bit dis of discrepancy, um, but if there's a, a gap, you know, there's something wrong right away. How, how, Donnie, how, what is the average discrepancy you see? So when you see a second platform, maybe you have an expensive, maybe you're using, you know, one of the Adobe. It doesn't hurt to have Google running on the side, especially in an expensive version where you can compare page metrics and key metrics and see how close are they. And what do we average, what do we see on average as a disparity when we run two tools? Donnie, I have a number in my head, but I want to hear what you say. Uh, I mean, there could be a big disparity and then you know there's something wrong, but um, a, a small disparity would probably be, you know, for a regular one would probably be about 5%. Yep, yep, about 5%, same number I have, all right? If you're in 5%, you're probably in the right zone. Now, I'm at a, I'm at a time, but uh, Matt, were you gonna say something? Yeah, sorry, I was just gonna, uh, one kind of final thing related to quality of data. Uh, you can also kind of audit your, your uh, digital data with, um, comparable metrics offline as well. So if you're driving, let's just say leads and you're capturing leads in a CRM, well audit what you're seeing in your CRM with what you're getting in your analytics platform to make sure that your conversion metric is accurate. Yeah. Phone calls or yeah. any number of data as well. Orders even if you're an e-commerce store. I'm gonna show you what you should be doing on your wall. Everybody learn from this. See the funnel, it's not just numbers. It's written here. See, it's in the spreadsheet. You wanna take those screenshots and put them in there. Now, if I were running your business or you said, can you help us with our organization? I would put poster size versions of that on my wall and I would write the conversion rate on there every day or every week, you know, uh, depending on how how much you see change and fluctuation, and on each step through the funnel, and then final conversion. And when it changed, forget all this fancy technology. Go up there with your pen, mark through the number, write the change on there, and note the difference. You should be monitoring that number always. By monitoring that number, you're able to sort of uh, adapt and adjust to changes, and candidly, a marketing department should be living around that number, because that's going to drive results for them. Make your walls talk. Don't underestimate the power of big visuals. Marketing is missing its way. And right now, understanding you know, how to get the data right and then understanding how to get the message right and then understanding the value proposition, that's all coming up in this series. It's an opportunity for us not just to learn, but we can come alongside of Teresa and rescue 3,500 small businesses.